Okay, it's 11 o'clock. It's a good time to start. Uh, first of all, I wish um, everyone a warm welcome to this event organized by um, Journal for Serbian and Croatian Issues, whichever way you define them, uh, called Tragovi in Croatian. It is, a, I suppose, closest to footprints in um, English. Our journal is... Um, is something that we started three years ago and we've published so far six issues. We are very much interested apart from publishing papers art and articles and book reviews. Uh, we're also interested in organizing debates about important issues um, covered by the character and the uh, objectives of um, the journal. And so we organize occasionally discussions about uh, recently published books but also um, we organize sometimes <clears throat> papers and discussions um, either on the topics that we consider to be um, currently in, a ver in the focus of Serbian and Croatian issues, but also in order to commemorate certain uh, events from the past. And uh, this is one of those events. Um, uh, today's event is actually to commemorate um, the 80th anniversary of tragic events of the massacres in Glina. Um, the Serb National Council, which is, who is a pub, which is a publisher of the journal as well, has already commemorated and marked this event um, <clears throat> in Glina itself. But we thought also that the issue of uh, war crimes, uh, massacres and genocides are very much also an academic um, issue interested in within the academic debates and we want, wanted to contribute to this. Uh, we couldn't think of a, a better way, and uh, I'm not sure there are no much many better ways of, of doing this, especially with regard to this topic, than to invite uh, Dr. Rory Yeomans, who is a, the um, who is a well-known uh, academic and author in the field of the uh, Ustrasha studies. I mean, if there is anything like that, but I mean, certainly in a, in a wider sense, also studies of genocide and uh, uh, war crimes and holocausts and the Second World War, including also not only the crimes themselves, but also the causes of the crime and uh, ideologies that, are be that were behind uh, these horrible um, events, which, very much marked the history, but also they do still influence very much the politics um, of both Serbs and, and Cro Croats. Uh, Dr. Rory Omans will deliver today um, a, a lecture of about 30 to 40 minutes. It depends. I mean, we will, we will give them as much time as, as he needs um, uh, under the title of Sacrifice and Terror towards a mimetic theory, theory of Ustasha killing. Let me just say very briefly that this will then be followed by a debate, that debate could be also in our language, Serbian and Croatian, but also in, in English, if there, if anyone needs help with this, I mean, we can certainly provide um, uh, some. And uh, we would like to invite uh, everyone who is uh, here present, and I see here very many well-qualified uh, people, and uh, I'm so glad that you are with us actually um, today, to, um, to think about maybe making a written comment or um, their own contribution on this particular topic and offering it to Tragovi so that we can perhaps in our November issue this year, the first, first next issue, publish both the uh, shorter and authorized version of um, Dr. Yora, uh, Dr. Yeoman's um, uh, today's paper, but also to launch a debate if there is interest in that with contribution of more than one uh, author on this particular issue, various aspects of the, of the topic. Um, very briefly to introduce uh, Dr. Yeomans, I mean, he is the author of uh, numerous studies of, uh, of this particular, uh, related to this particular topic, including I think is, I would say the best known uh, mm -hmm. also in our uh, region, uh, Visions of Annihilation, the Ustasha Regime and the Cultural Politics of Fascism, 1941-1945, published by Pittsburgh University Press in 2012. Then also the Utopia of Terror, Life and Death in Wartime Croatia, published by University of Rochester Press 2016. And he has submitted a manuscript, and so we are waiting for a new book uh, that is uh, to be uh, titled The City of the Dead, War and Martyrdom in Fascist Croatia. So we are expecting a new book by 
by mm -hmm. Rory Jermans. He got his PhD at School of Slavonic and East European Studies at the University College of London, uh, which uh, some of us uh, are very much familiar with. And without further ado, I would actually now give the microphone, not the floor, to, to Rory. And I, I will uh, turn into, uh, into uh, being an assistant in this particular uh, lecture by uh, basically operating the PowerPoints that he has pre presented that, that we've, we consider this to be much easier than to, um, than to, uh, than to do it in any other way. So uh, Rory, please, the floor is yours and I'm at your disposal. You just need to tell me when you want to start and, and how you want me to run the PowerPoints. Okay, so if you want to share, should the share them immediately, yeah. yes. Okay, Brilliant. thank you. Rory, it's you. Okay, we are very close. There we are. Brilliant. Okay, right. So let's begin. So first of all, Diane, thank you very much for inviting me to give this presentation this morning. And uh, thank you very much for the warm welcome and the warm introduction. So this is actually the research I'm going to be talking about this morning is from my forthcoming book, The City of the Dead which is being published by Harasovitz, I don't know, sometime in 2072 or whenever they, they, they finish editing the book. So I'm going to be talking in English this morning. So I'm aware that for most people, English is not your first language. So I'm going to keep the language as simple as possible. And I'm going to talk nice and slowly so that, you know, but if, if people are having trouble following, then please just put a message in the chat room or something if, if you're finding it difficult and you know I will adjust my language accordingly. So my presentation this morning is called Sacrifice and Terror towards a mimetic understanding of Ustasha violence. So that's the first um, theoretical word, mimetic, and it simply <laughs> means an imitation or a restaging of something. So if you're talking about mimetic violence, you're talking about a kind of violence, which is a restaging of a previous event. Um, and just to point out that I don't have a script to talk from. I don't have a, a piece of paper with nice, uh, neat sentences on it. So I tend to put presentations together with images and ideas that I think are important and interesting. And I hope other people find interesting and important, but I don't have a, you know, so I hope it will be easy enough for people to follow. So I chose this picture for the front cover because I think it really says something about the Ustasha regime and about our understanding of the Ustasha regime. I think this is a very stereotypical picture of the Ustasha regime. Uh, it's of a group of guards from Yasanovat's concentration camp. Uh, they've, they've obviously you know, just been involved in a massacre or killing of some kind. Um, and when I started my graduate studies and I decided I wanted to write about the Ustasha movement, I came across countless pictures like this, countless pictures of victims of the Ustasha movement with, you know, um, who'd been defaced or disfigured or mutilated, but there was very little understanding or there was very little explanation of why this was being done. And, and, and I really wanted to understand more about why this was happening and, and if it meant anything, if the reason they were doing this was because there was a reason behind it. So what I'm gonna talk about this morning is the character of Ustasha killing, the character of Ustasha violent, and I'm going to be arguing that it was, it, it was not illogical, it was not irrational, it actually had a meaning. There was a, a communicative meaning behind it. They did it for a very specific purpose which was to communicate to the corrupt population. And it was also to send a message to the community from which the victims came. And I think the majority of victims who were killed in a very sanguinary way, who were killed in a very bloody way, uh, who were mutilated um, and were killed in a very ritualistic way were Serbs. I don't think generally that Jews and Roma were necessarily killed in the same way. They were killed in very large numbers, but they were killed in a very, very different way. So that's, <clears throat> excuse me, so that's my thesis. 
Um, some people might disagree with it and that's fine. And we, we can discuss that after the presentation, um, but that's what I'm gonna be talking about this morning. Okay, Dan, do you want to go on to the first slide? So what I'm gonna do first of all is just give you a, an outline of the kind of studies and books that I found that have been really interesting for the work that I've been doing on my book. Then I'm gonna talk about what I call mimetic killing, which is this kind of symbolic killing, this very performative staged killing, looking at other international groups which have, which have you know, done very kind of similar things to the Ustasha movement. So this isn't something which is just about Croatia, it's something which is a kind of wider phenomenon. So then I'm gonna look at how that relates to Ustasha killing, these comparative examples. I'm then gonna say something about martyrdom culture and mass killing in the independent state of Croatia. Uh, mass killing and martyrdom were very intrinsically linked, very symbiotically linked in the Ustasha movement. They were both very, very important. And I'm gonna look at the Black Legion, uh, which is a very notorious death squad militia, Ustasha militia, um, because I think that they bring out those themes very well. So then I'm gonna move on finally to looking at the 1941, a series of atrocities in Glina in 1941, which became known as the Glina massacres. And then I'm gonna look a little bit about what happened after that and, and the impact of those killings uh, and, and the symbolic impact of those killings in the years between 1941 and 1945. Okay, so Dan, can we have the next slide, please? Okay, so first of all, you know, looking at the kind of books and the kind of theories that have influenced my thinking on this subject. So Aryan Apandurai, who's a very well-known anthropologist, he argues that quite often in civil wars and conflicts, when the victims physically look very similar, there's almost no physical differentiation between them, then what perpetrators will do is they will disfigure the faces of the victims. They will mutilate the bodies of the victims to try and create a difference which doesn't otherwise exist because then in that way, they're saying these people are not the same as us, they're other, they're different to us. So what they're literally doing is they're, particularly when they're mutilating people, is they're turning the victim's body inside out to find evidence, to find justification for the killing and to find evidence that that person is very different to them, even if they look almost exactly the same. And he also argued that the other thing that the perpetrator does is that they're also trying to stabilize their own identity. So they're no, not just trying to say this victim is different to me, but they're trying to say, I am very different to them and, and, and I belong to you know, the dominant ethnic group or the ethnic group that belongs in this country. So Vladimir Grobna, who was uh, a, a historian of medieval culture of violence, he had a very different view of disfigurement. He believed um, that when victims had their noses cut off or their lips cut off, that it was a, a way to make them anonymous, to make, you know, so they basically <laughs> didn't have a face anymore. Um, so, so those two views were, were diametrically opposed to each other. Um, and, you know, um, they are linked to each other, but they're also very, very different. So one is about marking a difference and the other one is about eradicating that person's <laughs> identity completely through what you've done to their face. And the third book that is really, really important for my work from a comparative perspective is Christopher C. Taylor's book, Sacrifices Terror, which is kind of where I got the title for this presentation from. Um, and he wrote um, about the Rwandan genocide of 1994 and what he called somatic killing. And I'm gonna explain what that is now. So Dan, can we move on to the next slide? Okay, so Christopher Taylor defined somatic killing as a kind of killing um, when you imagine that the victim uh, has done things to you and you then transfer the, the crimes that you feel the victim has committed against you to them. So the picture at the bottom is from a magazine called Kangora, which is a Hutu extremist Rwandan magazine. Uh, it was really kind of like a Rwandan version of Disturma, and it had lots of pictures of uh, a very, very anti-Tutsi magazine, had lots of pornographic pictures of Tutsi women, but it also had a lot of pictures of Hutu men being crucified, uh, being tortured, 
being murdered by Tutsi. And so what Christopher Taylor argues is that when the Hutu militias went into Tutsi villages, uh, the in, in Terra Hamwe and these other kinds of groups went into the villages and they and mutilated the Tutsi villagers and they hacked them to pieces. What they were doing is that they were replicating the crimes that they thought had been committed by the Tutsi against innocent Hutus onto the body of the Tutsis. And this is what he meant by somatic killing. It's kind of your feelings about what you feel the victim has done to you in the past. And then you kind of write it you know, you write a narrative of what you think they've done onto the body of the victim. Um, and another feature of the Inter Hamwe and other groups was that they, were, they carried out a lot of destruction of churches, of shrines, of chapels. So it wasn't just enough to uh, mutilate the bodies of the victims. You also needed to eradicate their identity and eradicate the evidence that they had ever been there. And the other thing that was very common, a very distinctive feature of the Rwanda genocide was the importance of the river and the river as an instrument of purification. So the Hutu uh, spokesman very often talks about that the river would carry away the Tutsi who were a foreign body in Rwanda. So the river becomes a, an instrument of genocide and it becomes an instrument of purification. And the only way you can purify the country is by taking the dead bodies away through the river. So the picture at the top is of Islamic State. Um, I'm sure everyone is familiar with Islamic State. They also uh, destroyed a lot of religious buildings, shrines and, and, and so on from, from Shia Muslims and Christians and so on. And I think as is well known, they killed their victims in very theatrical ways. But I think one of the things that a lot of commentators missed about the killings of Islamic State was the use of orange jumpsuits and why, why they used orange jumpsuits. So I think it's very clear why they use orange jumpsuits. When after the war in Afghanistan, Islamist fighters who were brought back from Afghanistan were paraded, well, they were, they were put into orange jumpsuits. They had shackles put around their ankles. Uh, chains put around their arms and they were kept in these, these, these very restricted cages. So I think that what Islamic State are doing here is that when they're parading these Western journalists before they're being executed, and obviously they film the executions, they're replicating what they think was done to Islamist fighters again. So it's that kind of mimetic and somatic killing where you replicate or you restage what you feel was done to your people or people that you identify with onto the victims. Okay, um, Dan, can we look at the next slide, please? Oh, no, the one before that. Yeah, this one. Okay, no, next one. Thank you. Okay, so how does this all relate to the character of Ustasha violence? So in the pictures at the top, there's a picture of the cathedral, the Orthodox Cathedral in Banja Luka, which was demolished in 1941 on the orders of Viktor Gutich, who was the Ustasha leader in Bosansk, Ukraine. And on the right is a picture of uh, members of the Ustashka Voynitsa, which was the main Ustasha party militia in the independent state of Croatia. So we know from numerous uh, photographic evidence and from witness testimony that the Ustasha movement you know, did engage in mutilation of its victims, disfigurement, dismemberment. Uh, they took a lot of photographs of what they were doing as well. And I think, you know, this was very communicative. This was done deliberately. It, it, it wasn't done by accident. So Alexander Korb, who has written quite a bit actually on this subject, he argues that one of the reasons why the Ustasha movement didn't bury their victims was because they didn't actually have a blueprint for genocide which you know, is an argument I don't really agree with. I think the burial of the victims was not because they were not prepared for the scale of the killing. I think the reason that Ustasha militias did not bury their victims, sometimes they, they left them out in the fields or they threw them into rivers. I think this was communication and I think it was done deliberately uh, to send a message, uh, as I said, to the victims and to the community from which the Ustashas themselves came. The other thing I think that's maybe not understood by everyone about the Ustasha movement was that even though it's well known that they destroyed a lot of churches and they destroyed a lot of chapels, 
I think people don't necessarily know how systematic the destruction was. So one of the first institutions which the Ustasha movement established in 1941 was the Office for the Destruction of Orthodox Buildings, Urush, and that operated until September 1941 when it was closed down and the Endeha suddenly decided it was going to change the way it, it related to the Serb population. And obviously, you know, there was uh, the mass conversions and then the creation of, uh, of the Croatian Orthodox Church. But as I said, they, they destroyed an awful lot of buildings um, and most of the uh, artifacts were then taken to museums or they were transferred to uh, Croatian um, Catholic churches. The other thing that was very important for the Ustasha movement was the river, particularly the river Drina. This had a very kind of mystical meaning for the Ustasha movement. Um, they saw the Drina as a dividing line between the dirty east and the clean west. Um, and they saw that it, it, it was a border between you know, a very primitive, very filthy society and the kind of society that they were trying to build themselves. So it was a very, very important part of their kind of mystical view of the world. Diane, can we look at the next slide, please? Okay, so I think above all uh, militias in the independent state of Croatia, the militia which is most associated with the River Drina is the Black Legion. Uh, it was basically a death squad that operated in Eastern Bosnia during the Second World War. Uh, it was implicated in a huge number of atrocities against the Serb population there. Um, and it was led by a man called Yuri Francetic who is in the picture at the top. And the picture at the bottom is a propaganda book from 1942 about the Black Legion called Men Who Look Death in the Face. And it's, it's all kind of perpetuating the very heroic view of the Ustasha movement. So in April 1942, the Black Legion carried out a number of atrocities in the Drina Valley in places like Vlasenica and Kravica. And there was one particular example where they drove hundreds of Serb um, citizens to the River Drina, and then they shot them, and then others tried to escape by jumping into the river, and they drowned. And so what I thought was really interesting about this particular example, which the Germans, you know, basically wanted Franz Hetic dismissed because, you know, because of all the atrocities his legion was committing, was the way it was framed by war reporters, and legionary journalists. So they had a completely different view of the atrocity. What was interesting was that they didn't try to hide that it had happened. And, and, and usually these massacres were not made public, but they, they tried to kind of invert it to turn it into something very different. So Willem Perosh, who was one of the chief propagandists for the Black Legion, he was a, a journalist as well. He said that the Black Legion had stamped for all the Drina as an eternal border of Croats um, towards the east. And the Ferdo Pavisic wrote that whole divisions of enemy bodies and decapitated heads were carried away on the tempestuous waves of the Drina, which was also drenched in the blood of the first and chosen Croats. So that's kind of really, really uh, interesting to me that they kind of turned it around into a place where a you know, Croat warriors were being killed. They were shedding their blood in the Drina. And then, you know, they were very, very open about the kind of sanguinary crimes that had been committed there. And the poem on the left is, was written by a young poet called Vladimir Yershich. He was a Ustasha youth leader in Sarajevo, and he was a very prolific writer and a prolific poet. Um, and I'm not gonna read the whole poem, but it, it, I think this poem is really indicative of the way that the Ustasha movement framed the river Drina. So, you know, he, he, it's all about, you know, the dark bloody canyons of, of the Drina River, but it's also a place where, you know, dead Ustasha warriors swim and sleep. And, and but when the time comes, you know, when, when Croat citizens are, are calling for them to rise and defend the Croats from Chetniks and partisans, then, then they will suddenly awake and you know, they, will, they will rise up to defend their populations. So I think the imagery is, is kind of very, very interesting here. Um, and like all militias, the Ustasha militia had a very well-developed cult of martyrdom. Um, so it was always emphasizing that you know, it's young warriors were, were dying, fighting for the independent state of Croatia. So one of the uh, most well-known martyrs from the Black Legion was a young 
a worker called Josip Krijanats, who was uh, a member of the 1st Battalion. And in 1942, he wrote a book about Yuri Francetich and the Black Legion. And it's very graphic, it's very visceral, it's very open about the atrocities being committed by the Black Legion, but it frames it as, you know, atrocities against partisans and Chetniks and insurgents rather than against innocent civilians. Um, and he died somehow in 1942. So his book was published posthumously in 1943, but in the introduction to his book, the editor of the book, Willem Perosh, actually describes how he was, he was captured by orthodox women and he was uh, put onto a, roasted, onto a roasting spit and he was roasted above a fire. And his last words were, you know, long live the independent state of Croatia, long live the Poglavnik, long live Yuri, and then he died. And this was a really, really common trope in Ustasha iconography, in Ustasha propaganda. You know, the warriors were almost always roasted on a spit, almost always by women. Um, and then they always expired when they were they were saying long live the independent state of Croatia. And I think you can see um, that that has very strong religious undertones as well. You know, this is saints, many saints were, were, were burnt at the stake um, and they were killed this way. So I think it has very, very strong religious undertones as well. Okay, Diane, the next slide. And this is just a very, very um, quick slide. I'm not going to go into it in any great detail. This is another picture of Yuri Francetich with um, some of his legionaries and his deputies. Um, and this is just to make the point that the, the same trope about the Black Legion and about the Drina was also prevalent in films, propaganda films. So one of the most uh, important films, I think well-known films about the Black Legion and the Drina was made in 1942. The director was quite a well-known Croatian director, Branko Marjanovic, who actually made one of the first post-war partisan films about called Zastava, which is about a ballerina who joins the anti-fascist movement um, and she, she, she fights the partisans. But in 1942, he made this film, uh, Straja Nadrini, which is about the Black Legion and it won first prize for the documentary section at the Vienna Biennial. Um, and again, it's the same kind of, if you look at the commentary that I've quoted here on the left, it's the same, kind of language which is all about you know purifying the eastern borders of Croatia um, about you know the, the bloody nature of the Drina and so on and about annihilation so the river was you know as I said for as for um, Hutu extremists the river was a really really important instrument of purification okay Diane the next slide okay so now coming on to Gleena and looking how this fits into the Gleena massacres so just a bit of background about Gleena itself. Um, I mean, the, the person who's a real expert on Gleena is Igor Mikhail, who, who's a friend of mine. He's written, you know, masses. He's done masses of research on this subject. Um, so kind of like probably 25% of the stuff in my book about Gleena is from him. I mean, I wouldn't be able to have done this book without the huge amount of work that he's done on the subject. So here are two um, the photographs Photograph on the left is a picture of one of the main thoroughfares, one of the main streets in Gleena, which is King Alexander Street. And you can see there in the middle is the turret of the Orthodox Church. Um, it's a very well-known street with lots of shops. It's a very, very busy place. And then on the right is a ceremony which took place in, I think, 1938, 1937, which was the consecration of the new bells for the Orthodox Church in the town. And you can see there at the front of the photograph, there is the bill, bell which is covered in flowers. So Galena, I think, was quite a well integrated town. It had a very vibrant social life. It had a cinema, it had a football team, uh, the Galena Sporting Club, which is known as Geshka, um, which you know, brought Croats and Serbs together into the same team. And it was followed by everybody in the town. It was a very successful team. Um, people lived next door to each other. There, there was no kind of segregated communities. So in some ways, it's a very integrated town. And quite a lot of the time, Serbs and Croats and Jews went, went, went to the same schools. Um, but it also had an Ustasha movement, uh, particularly from the 1930s, late 1930s onwards, that was led by a man called Mirko Puk, who was a lawyer in the town. And he later became the Minister of Justice in the independent state of Croatia. And another man called Mirko Jeret, who was a less successful lawyer. Um, 
And the Ustasha movement was quite small, but it was very vociferous. It was one of the most extreme branches of the Ustasha movement in, I think probably in the Endeha and certainly in the late years of Yugoslavia. I don't know why it was so extreme, but, but it gained a reputation even amongst other Ustasha branches, other Ustasha organizations. So for example, the Karlovats Ustashas saw the Glina Ustashas as like way too radical even for them. So that's kind of interesting that even uh, within the organization, it was known as a very kind of extreme movement. Okay, Diane, the next slide. So one of the things that happened after the foundation of the independent state of Croatia in 1941 was there a series of what I would call show trials when former Yugoslav officials, uh, former Serbian officials, judges, policemen, uh, high ranking army officers were put on trial for crimes they had allegedly committed against Croat nationalists in the 1920s and in the 1930s. So one of these show trials took place in Glina Merkel Puk, who by then was a Minister of Justice, he actually came back for the trial and he, he, he gave some testimony. A lot of the defendants were actually Croats because they were Croats who'd served in, 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 you know, they'd served the Yugoslav state, but some of them were Serbs as well. And actually most of the vitriol uh, was actually directed towards the, the, the Serb defendants rather than the Croat ones. Um, and so what happened during this trial was that lots of witnesses came forward, just ordinary people, who'd been members of the Ustasha movement or who had been nationalist activists in the 1930s. They all came forward to talk about the, the alleged crimes that had been committed against them when they'd been arrested and put into prison. Um, and there's just an example here. It was uh, reported in Novi List, which is a Zagreb uh, Ustasha newspaper. Um, and this one of these witnesses, Stepan Suryak, who was an agricultural worker, he talks about how they smashed his skull in the interrogation room uh, against the wall. They beat him on the whole of his body and on the soles of his feet. They hanged him on a stake and they put salt in his tongue and threatened to kill him. Other witnesses said they'd been beaten with hammers. Uh, they had had nails hammered under their fingers. And the picture on the right is, um, on the left, is of a group of detained Serbian peasants. And there's a, a, a Ustasha's registering at the table. They always seem to register people. And there's a kind of, an Ustasha guards, and there's a kind of comic formality to a lot of that. And I think what's really interesting about this particular quote, and I think about uh, these kinds of, there were so many of these in the end they had, there were so many books that, related the suffering of nationalists and Ustasha in Yugoslavia. I think what's really interesting is, is that a lot of the things that he describes are things which Ustasha militias then did to the Serbs that they rounded up as well. So I think it's, I think this is very, I think a lot of Ustasha killing was very somatic. It was like the killing Rwanda, where the people who were carrying out the killing were carrying replicating crimes that they think had been committed against them or had been committed against you know that the, their fellow croats and they were then inflicting that violence onto the bodies of the serbs okay next slide please diane okay so now coming on to the two cleaner massacres so there were two sets of massacres in 1941 in Glina. There was a massacre in the town itself between the 11th and the 12th of May, 1941. And then there were a series of second massacres between late July and mid-August, 1941, when Serb men were brought from Serb villages, were brought from outlying villages from outside Lina, and they were brought to the Orthodox Church in King Alexander Street, and they were tortured and they were massacred. So the photograph on the left is a picture of a man called Nikola Shemajic, who was a player for Geshka, the football team, and he was also a shoemaker. And he's thought to be the only person who survived the first massacre. And then the man on the right in the sailor suit is a man called Anti Shesherin. He was a Croat, but he, he was not a supporter of the Ustasha movement. He was a communist activist, an underground communist activist, and, but he was in charge, he was partially in charge of the electrical municipal station in Glina, 
um, and he was in charge of basically turning the lights out um, when the atrocities were taking place, because that was one of the orders, was that the lights had to be out. So looking at the first massacre, so the first massacre really began on the 10th of May, 1941, when a number of buses carrying Ustasha militiamen came directly from Zagreb and it came to Glina. And there they met up with the Glina Ustashas. And then on the night of May the 11th, they literally just went round all the houses of Serbs, knocked on the doors, and arrested people and took them away. Some people were able to escape because there was one man who was drunk in a barn, so he missed the massacre. There were, there were other people who were just away on that day and they came back later, so they kind of escaped it. But pretty much most, I think an awful lot of Serbs who were males who were above the age of 16 were caught up in these roundups. Um, and some people were there by accident. So a lot of students were there because Belgrade had been bombed and they wanted to come back home or, or they were home for the Easter holidays. So a lot of people also got caught up in it by accident. So they were paraded through the streets. Um, it was nighttime, so there weren't that many people around. Um, but what, what's interesting is when Mirko Puk was interviewed um, about his ordeal as a nationalist in uh, Yugoslav Glina, he said that one of the things that happened in 1918 was that Croatian nationalists were paraded through the streets um, by Serbian soldiers. So, you know, maybe there's, there's a kind of reflection of that there. So they were taken to the prison, they were beaten and they were tortured. And um, one of the Croatian eyewitnesses, I think it was Anti Shesharin actually, because he was arrested. Um, he says that quite a few of the victims had their mustaches and their beards pulled out, which obviously is, is just a form of torture and a form of sadism. But in the independent state of Croatia as well, People were not men were not meant to have beards and moustaches. They were they were they were seen as a mark of otherness and and because they were associated with the Serbian community, not just with Chetniks, but with, with with just kind of Serbian peasants and so on. They were meant to have beards and moustaches. So I also see this pulling out of beards and moustaches as a kind of um, way of eradicating their identity. And, and a way of kind of disfiguring them as well at the same time as well. And, you know, many of the things that were done to them in the prison were very, very similar to the things which the Croatian nationalists describe in, in the show trials before. So then they were put into trucks. They were really in a bad state. Many of the people that they'd really been beaten to a pulp and then they were taken to outlying villages and some of them were shot. Some of them were stabbed and they were put into pits, but the pits were not big enough. So they had peasants, they recruited Croatian peasants to dig graves. And one of the Croatian grave diggers reported to the authorities when he gave his testimony after the war, that one of the Ustashas who came to the site to, to, to kill the prisoners, he was actually wearing an apron, a butcher's apron, and he dismembered one of the victims uh, limb by limb. Now, I don't know if this story is true. I think a lot of testimonies that people gave out after the war, um, I think a lot of people were suffering from post-traumatic stress disorder. Uh, there were people were very suggestible to things that, that were being reported in the newspapers. Um, and there were already these narratives being created about, you know, the sanguinary crimes of the Ustasha movement. But I think it's really important. I think it's really interesting that he mentions it. So whether he's saying it because it did happen or whether he's saying it because he thinks that's what the authorities wanted to hear or whether he's saying that because that was his impression of the Ustasha movement, I still think it kind of says something about the nature of the Ustasha movement as well. And as I said, Nikola Shemajic was the one person who's known to have escaped. He managed to get out of his, the, he was tied his wrists were tied by ropes, but he managed to undo them. He managed to run and jump in a river and, and he escaped. And then, you know, after the war, he moved to Belgrade. So that was the first massacre, um, as I said, which did have some kind of ritualistic and mimetic elements to it. The second, second set of massacres took place in late July to early August, 1941. In villages, they, uh, the first group of men who were taken to the Orthodox Church in Galina were from villages like Tepushko. And the second group of men were a group of men who came from Chelemenica. They were 
they were asked to go to Virgin Moss to be baptized, which they willingly did. And they set off with flags and, you know, banners and they were singing and they were very happy to be converted because they thought this meant they would be okay. They, they would be safe. And then they were transported to Gleaner and obviously they were massacred in the church as well. So I'm going to concentrate on the first of these groups, which was the group from places like Tepushko, because three people actually survived that. We know that three people actually survived that massacre. Um, so the three survivors were Adam Koratz, who he was released because apparently he, he had friends in, when he got to the church, he's released because he was baptized and he also had friends in the Ustasha movement. And after the war, he was seen as kind of a bit of a collaborator. And, and I don't think I don't know where he went after war. I think he might have been imprisoned. I'm not sure about that. But he didn't make I haven't found a testimony, so I, I, I don't know things from his point of view. The second survivor was a guy called Pio Vorkapic, who, like Adam Koratz, he was released before the massacres in the church started. Um, and he actually did make a testimony, a very moving and a very emotional testimony after the war, because he was also under consideration to be prosecuted for, you know, collaboration. I don't think he was in the end. Um, but one of the things that he said was that they were actually taken, the men from Tepusco were taken to their local church and they were forced to demolish the church. So not the walls, but they were forced to smash the windows, tear up the books, um, uh, smash the benches. So, so again, you know, you, you can see that kind of ritualistic element uh, that the Eustachian movement was doing that kind of staging of killing and the kind of staging of humiliation. So then they were all taken to the church in Glina, the Orthodox church in Glina. And again, you know, why use the church rather than the prison? They could have been taken to the prison or they, they could have been killed in the places. So I think there, I think there was something else going on here. Um, and so he, 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 he and Adam Koratz left before the massacre. So Lyuban Yednak, who was, the, who was a young peasant, he was the third person who survived. And his, his testimony is, is very, very interesting. He says that, you know, when they got into the church, it was candlelight. Uh, the victims were made to take an oath to the Poglavnik in the independent state of Croatia. Uh, a young Croatian soldier came in and told them, you know, you were sentenced to death in 1918. Uh, now the sentence is gonna be carried out. Um, there were people were brought to the front of the church and they were put on the altar. One guy had his chest ripped open with a knife and um, another guy had his throat slit and then he was forced to sing. So there, as again, there's all these kind of ritualistic elements to it, you know, the candlelight and taking the oath um, to the Poglamli. And then the men were put into trucks, the bodies were put into trucks and they were transported to outlying villages. And again, they were um, thrown into pits and they were murdered and most of them died. Alubo Nednak actually survived um, because he pretended he was dead. Um, but actually when he got to the pit, they still lifted him up to take his t-shirt because he had a very nice t-shirt that they wanted. And so after the war, so after the massacre had happened, um, the church itself was demolished. They took the church apart brick by brick. That was the decision the Ustasha authorities made. Um, and most of the artifacts were either given to, and the bells were given to Catholic churches, um, or they were given to museums in Zagreb, like these handicraft museums and things as well. So after the war, they interviewed pretty much the whole town, it seems, about the massacre. And people had all kinds of very gruesome stories about their experiences of the night of this massacre in the Orthodox Church, this first massacre in the Orthodox Church. So, you know, residents told stories that, you know, um, uh, they saw all these Ustashas walking around with just really blood soaked shirts. There's one guy that was in a park and this Ustasha came down and sat next to him and, and he was asking for a cigarette and he's covered in blood. You know, people remembered that the steps of the church were covered in blood and in some cases, People say they were actually invited into the church, you know, to look at the dead bodies. Um, and on the night of the massacre, there was a wake for a local Ustasha who had been killed in an ambush, I think by partisans or insurgents of some kind. And a group of Ustashas from the church came into his house where his, obviously it was an open casket. And, you know, they raised knives in the air and they were covered in blood and, and, and said, now we've avenged you. And there was another story that's, 
really bizarre, which is um, an innkeeper's wife who says that one of the Ustashas came into her church and came into her inn with the beating heart of one of the victims and he wanted to know how to cook it. And look, I mean, I think it's very difficult to know whether these stories are correct. They're very gruesome and they're very bloody and they're very sanguinary. But again, I, I think they tell you something about the way that ordinary people perceive the Eustachian movement and the way they felt the Eustachian movement um, should be framed for you know, the authorities as well. So I, I think it's kind of really interesting in terms of the kind of stories that people did tell uh, after the war and um, you know, what they thought about what had happened. Okay, Dan, can we look at the final screen, please? Okay, so I just wanted to say something about what happened after the killing. So I think after the massacres in the church and also the roundup and killing of the Serbian elite in the town itself, I think that had a very traumatic effect on many people in Glina. So there's a news report from 1942 when Anti Pavlic, the Poglavnik, visits the town. And, you know, the newspapers try to turn it into this very joyous occasion. And it's obvious that the town is, is very traumatized and it's basically a garrison town. And actually, Gleaner is the, one of the first towns to fall to the partisans permanently at the end of 1943. So it, it collapses very, very quickly. Um, and, and there's actually film of, of Pavlic traveling, walking through the town, and there's just bunkers and, and, and things everywhere, and, and, and it's not a terribly uh, happy sight. So um, there's a memoir, there's a woman, young, a young woman came to the town just after the first killing, the, the killing in May, uh, called Benedicta Zelic Bushan. She was related to some of the leading Ustashas in the town, and she came from Dalmatia, but she came to the town to work as a teacher and as an Ustasha youth instructor. And she said the town was like one of the saddest places she'd ever been to. She, she just, you know, it was so quiet and nobody really said anything. So I think it definitely had an impact on them. And I also, you know, think that the massacre in Glina, became, the massacres in Glina became very well known to other Ustasha movements through the state. So the Karlovats Ustashas mentioned this quite a few times. And this is the reason why they said they would never work with the Glina Ustashas, because the Glina Ustashas just wanted to kill, you know, women and children and, 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 and they couldn't. They, they just felt they couldn't work work with them you know obviously that was making themselves trying to look better as well but it, it's kind of interesting that even for them that that was a step too far and one thing that's also quite interesting is if you look at a lot of the Ustasha literary journals from 1942 to 1945 in particular there is this recurring motif of the destruction of churches and there will always be a group of Ustashas inside the church and they'll be fending off the partisans or they're fending off the Chetniks and they refuse to come out um, and the church is destroyed and they are destroyed with the church as well. And I mean, there were incidences where this happened. There was a very famous uh, occasion in shit in Herzegovina, uh, which Mila, Mila Van Dias talks about in his book where, you know, the Ustasha is burned in the belfry because they refuse to come out. There was the burning of a church in Turapolia. It's a wooden church with the Ustashas inside. But I think the sheer volume of them is, is I think that what they're trying to do with that, I think the Glina massacre was a real embarrassment to the Ustasha movement. And what they're trying to do in a lot of those stories is they're basically turning the story around. So they're, they're turning the, you know, the bodies of the dead served victims into Ustasha martyrs so that the, 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 perpetrators actually become the victim of the story. So I think that's really, really interesting what they do there. So I have the two pictures here. I don't know if they're from Gleena, but, but the, you know, they, they kind of, they're showing, um, I think the first anniversary or the second anniversary of the independent state of Croatia. And I think the point to make is that I think for the officially in the Eustachia movement, nothing really changed for it very much in Gleena. I mean, there was more insurgency and there were, there was more resistance, but I don't think they kind of changed their attitude. Um, and I just um, have one example of this that I think is uh, quite interesting of, of how the Galena Ustashas remain very, very hard line and they continued, you know, using this kind of sanguinary imagery. So uh, to mark All Souls Day in 1942, the Galena branch of Havatska Jena, which was a nationalist, kind of a nationalist tending 
women's movement in Croatia, they unveiled a monument to uh, commemorate the first anniversary of the independent state of Croatia and to commemorate all the Croat soldiers who had died in the First World War, as well as, and I quote, heroes fallen for Croatian liberation and independence. So in her speech, uh, Ljubica Perepic, who was the president of Hrvats Gajena, uh, talked about the many young Croat sons who had died heroic deaths, perishing at the hands of hijacked bullets. Um, and she talked about how, you know, they're given their blood and their young lives. And as a result, Croatia was drenched in so much blood. And, you know, quite a lot of um, members of the Ustasha movement, local Ustasha movement and supporters came to the unveiling of the monument. And she said they should swear above the still fresh graves of these brave warriors, above their ashes and dust, that they would protect and defend our dear homeland and endeavor to destroy every trace of the alien weed which seeks only to, them, to dismember us or hijack our freedom. And I think it's really interesting that she uses this kind of language because this is in November, 1942. This is at a time when the Ustasha movement and the independent state of Croatia was you know, moving away from that kind of language. Um, it was generally liquidating people in concentration camps. Um, it had declared that the Serbs were Croats of the Orthodox faith, um, and yet they were still using the same kind of language about them, talking about them as alien weeds that need to be destroyed, and people, and, you know, talking about that they were dismembering, you know, our, and hijacking our freedom. So, you yeah, know, in conclusion, um, I think it's really, really important to think about why they killed people in the way they did. I think some of it might have been utilitarian. You know, they didn't have guns and they didn't have, you know, mass means of destruction. They didn't have gas chambers and, and things like this as well. But I also think the violence was communicative. And I think it's really important to understand it now because I think one of the reasons why negationism, historical negationism in Croatia, particularly around the Ustasha movement, uh, as a lot stronger than you know it should be it should never be strong but it but it, it's kind of has more influence than than you know you would hope it would have is because i think a lot of the things that the ustash movement did are not very well understood they look completely irrational and completely illogical and so it's very easy for people to say well this can't have happened because it's just crazy nobody would do that kind of thing so i think it's really important that you know historians and researchers and writers um, try and understand why these things happen. And this is just, you know, a starting point. Um, you know, other people will probably have very different views to me on this um, and, and have things to say about it. Um, but anyway, so I hope that's been um, interesting uh, insight into some of the kind of research I'm doing at the moment um, and which is gonna be in my new book. Um, and yeah, if you have any questions, then please feel free to ask me. Thank you very much for listening. Thank you so much, Rory, first of all, I mean, for such a comprehensive and, uh, of course, sad and gruesome and, and tragic story. But I mean, the one that actually really made some um, great points um, to think think about further. I mean, of course, I mean, as you were speaking, I uh, some some ideas or associations to other books and, and works by other people came to my, to, to me. For example, what, what you just said at the end, I mean, it's really Hannah Arendt's point, isn't it? I mean, it's not just like craziness and there is, uh, we need to understand the roots and, and the causes in order to understand the events and there are possible consequences. Also, it has much more than just historical uh, message, I think, because it is also this is this issue of perpetuating um, events uh, based on previous events or their interpretation, and and this brought me to also to mention maybe Max Bertholz and his his work on on Skandal mm. I mean I, I would I, I mean if there is enough time at the end because I now really want to give the floor to other people to ask and comment, but if there is a time at the end, I mean I, I would like to see for example you know this events in Glina in in the light of what he suggested happened in, in Skandarav Baku, because he suggested it is also a personal motivation, sometimes uh, very mm. much based on, you know, avenging for previous events or alleged events, you know, so, so also, 
but it's also due to uh, radicalism and extremism of particular people um, uh, on the ground. Now, I wonder whether this is, uh, on the other hand, of course, here we are talking of the regime, which introduced all these um, laws, uh, very discriminatory, uh, based mm -hmm. on Nazis, Nazism as, as an ideology, uh, which were meant really to eradicate, eliminate, and destroy uh, Serb community as well as Jewish and, and, and Roma and so on yeah. so forth. But I mean, that's something that we can probably discuss uh, later on. Thank you so much uh, once again. Okay. I see Aneta is already um, has registered uh, for the question. I would like to invite everybody else also to raise your hands and I will register whoever wants to talk and then we will we'll give you the floor. Aneta, please. Uh, thank you, uh, Diane, and thank you, Rory, for your um, uh, for your uh, research. I would like to ask a few questions, and uh, just uh, to give uh, before the questions, I would like to give an example about the uh, negationism and history relativism um, uh, in Croatia. And you have mentioned Jure Francetic. He was actually in a magazine that there was an article about him and the Black Legion, the magazine that is called uh, Military History, 2013. This magazine was offered in schools to the younger students. Um, so there, there is a constant uh, uh, effort to, uh, to, to, to uh, uh, combat the history facts in Croatian society, unfortunately. But, what I was going to ask you, uh, one is, did you analyze the relations between um, social context uh, of the, between social context and the way of ki killings, of Ustasha killings of the Serbs particularly or uh, everyone else? Uh, did you analyze uh, the, the symbolism of killings, the Serbs and for example, communists, partisan fighters? And uh, are there any relations between uh, the way the other collaborators, armies like Ukrainian or Estonian killings of the Jews and these yeah. Ustasha killings of the Serbs? And the other thing, I'm sorry if I'm speaking. That's okay. Um, yeah, too much. And the other thing is, uh, unfortunately, or luckily, whatever you, you look at it, I'm dealing more with the way we are remembering or the way we are forgetting. Mm. And um, uh, there is always uh, a slight, um, or actually a big uh, danger to have this uh, martyrology fascinating by killings. I'm not sure yeah. with my English, so I hope that, that you understood. Yeah. Um, so we have this fascination by the brutality of Ustasha killings, which is sometimes unavoidable, but uh, he, a culture of remembrance has its uh, responsibility towards future as well towards the past. And uh, when we are in Serbian National Council dealing with this memory, we are not avoiding trying to avoid uh, the brutality, but the way we are speaking about yeah. it shouldn't be literal and it should be uh, uh, responsible towards the audience and uh, yeah. towards the victims as well, because I think this fascination with killings is dismantling the whole lives and beauty of these lives before they were deported mm. and, and brutally killed. Yeah. And I think this, uh, I think maybe historiography should also be aware of this. And yeah. I'm, I'm sure that you are, I, I, um, I, I know your work. Uh, I'm not trying to say that you're not, but I think this, you know, a yeah. few points that are very yeah. um, important when we are doing this anthropological historical yeah. analysis. Yeah, sure. And thank you uh, once again. Thank you, Dan. Okay, you, shall I, I just I, answer those questions? Just as you like. Yes, absolutely. I mean, okay, so first of all, thank you, you yes. Aneta, very, very much for those questions. I think they're all great questions. I think the final question, you're exactly where I am. So the work I'm doing at the moment is looking at the Serbian victims and the Jewish victims. Uh, so what they were like as people, you know, the kind of li lives they led before they were killed. Um, I'm doing a lot of work on the deportations and Aryanization. And it's really, really important for me that I look at the victims and I understand, you know, because they had lives before they were killed, that their, their lives amount to more than just victims than bodies. You know, they were people who lived and 
they had happy lives and they had aspirations and dreams and so on. So that's really, really important part of my work. Um, and so, yes, absolutely. I think that's really, really important. And I also just think that if all you ever do when you're talking about the Ustasha movement is talk about all the massacres and the killings and you're just kind of listening, it becomes kind of banal. It becomes actually boring and it shouldn't be boring because it's so, the story is so horrible, you know, but it becomes banal because it's just the same things that are repeated over and over again. And I think it doesn't, it doesn't do anything to address negationism. And I think another reason, and I've written about this before when I was at Princeton, um, why I think negation is people like um, Igor Vukic and so on are kind of slightly more popular is because, you know, I've read their work and their work is terrible. It's just, it's very, very flawed historiographically, but they actually write in a way that communicates with you know, ordinary educated people. And I think a lot of people who, well, some people who write on this subject, you know, you, I read it because I have to, because I have to know what the research is, but who else is reading it? It's a few academics. And I do think that we as historians, as researchers, and, you know, and I don't exclude myself from this criticism, we need to learn to write in a way which engages with ordinary people, with their emotions and, and, something they can identify with, you know, and, and, and I think that's something we need to get a lot better at. As for your other points, so absolutely. So one of the things that I didn't mention in the presentation, but is in my book, is one of the things I look at is what happens to the ownership of the property and the businesses of the victims of the first Gleaner massacre. And what you find is that a lot of the people who take over the shops and the butchers and the bakers and so on, their apprentices or, you know, the, the, the base of Ustasha supporters in Glina is at the top layer, you have businessmen and entrepreneurs and lawyers and doctors, but then below that, it's very working class. Uh, it's people who basically are economically lower down the ladder. Um, and some of them take great advantage of this and they basically just, um, you know, when, the, when all the shops are nationalized and they're, um, you know, taken into the ownership of the state and they basically become commissioners for these shops. And there's all these adverts in papers like Hrvatska Novina, which is the, the, the Ustasha movement newspaper in Sisak, um, you know, and all, they're all under new management. And you think, I, I remember, I, rem I recognize that name. And then you realize it was the butcher's apprentice or somebody like that instead. And it's someone who actually took part in the massacres as well. I mean, I would also have to say that, you know, even though I said the Glina Ustasha movement as a whole is quite extreme, there are also uh, Glina Ustashas who really save their Serbian friend. You know, this is the weird thing is they, they take part in the massacres or they take part in the roundups of citizens, but then they also, you know, go and see their friends and say, go and hide or, or go and stay with your grandmother in the village because they're going to arrest everyone tonight, you know? So there's, there's a very kind of weird kind of relationships going on. So I, and I think this relates to your point about Ukraine with the uh, massacres of the Jews and so on, that I think in order to kill people in this way to mutilate people you have to have a really personal relationship with them maybe not a personal relationship but you have to have a strong feeling towards them and i think absolutely if you look at ukraine you know they the jews were were killed in horror i mean really horrible ways they had their heads cut off by axes and, and they were mutilated and tortured because I think there was some kind of personal relationship there. There was an emotional relationship there. And I think in order to do these things to people, um, you need to have some kind of emotional connection. And I think it's interesting that I'm not aware of many examples of Jews or Roma being killed in this way in Croatia, in the independent state of Croatia. I mean, Roma were almost entirely annihilated. I mean, I think 94, 95% were murdered in, in the Poremas. And, you know, 87, 88% of Jews were, were murdered in the Holocaust. But I think apart from a few isolated incidents, they weren't killed in this very kind of ritualistic way. They were, you know, sent to concentration camps or you know, um, yes, yeah, so I think that's kind of interesting. And, and I, I, my explanation is that I don't think most Ustashas or a lot of Ustashas were quite extreme nationalists before the war. So they had very strong feelings about the Serbs. They didn't have strong feelings about Jews or Roma. I mean, they did it because that's what Nazi Germany wanted them to do. 
but I don't think they had strong feelings. I think the emotional relationship was with the Serbs because because just because of the history and 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 because there were far more of them and because of the whole history of Yugoslavia. So I, I think you're absolutely right. I think there has to be an emotional relationship in, in order to, to to do these these kinds of things. And I think with the communists, I, I again I'm not aware that I mean there are a few pictures where they have communists or you know who who are just about to be beheaded. But I mean so I think so many. I think so many Serbs in the 1940s joined the partisans or they they identified with the partisans because you know of what they were going through that you're kind of thinking well was that person killed in that way because he was a communist or was he killed because he was a Serb and he happened you know to be a communist as well and yeah I, I mean the communists were Croat communists were treated very badly in Yasanovac they really were treated horribly um, but I, I don't think the ritualistic killing, I think this is very much a thing that was targeted at the Serbs. And I think there are some very obvious anthropological and psychological reasons why, because I said, I think it was communicative. I think it was done deliberately in a lot of cases. And I think it was there to send a message, a very powerful message. Thank you, Rory. Another important thing is naming the people as well. I mean, who were victims, I mean, because if you if you think of Yasanovets, I mean, as some our colleagues would say, you know, it's really difficult to to identify in our memory one mm. single person killed in Yasanovets. Mm. I mean, that is really a problem for the for the uh, politics of memory and and uh, and and uh, politics of history in general, right? So I think yeah. in the case of Glina, we all knew about Ljuban Jednak, but mostly. For, for later on um, Artukovic trial, right? I mean, mm -hmm. that was one thing that suddenly brought him back to the light, even to those who haven't actually heard for him before. I mean, I yeah. attended the Artukovic trial, by the way, as a young uh, journalist at that oh, time. Wow. So yeah. I saw him, but I mean, uh, okay, we know one person, the survivor, but I mean, you have now identified Nikola Samarjic and others. I mean, it and is also very important. Borkapic and Adam Borkapic as well. And, and this is this yeah. is why why I think Igor Merkel's work is also very important because it focuses yeah. on a particular individual. We published in one of our first issues, the article on this uh, Catholic priest, uh, Zhuzhak, yeah, uh, yes, an interesting Zizek, figure yeah. in this in this difficult time. So whoever wants to have a look at this, I mean, you you may actually go back to one of the first issues of Dragovi. Now yeah. I see the Diana Bohlin or Diana Bohlin. You know, if you could just say a word or two about yourself, yes. and then of course it's you. <laughs> Thank yeah. you. Yeah, I would like switch on the camera so you see this face. <laughs> Otherwise, sure, sure. it's maybe. Yeah, my question would be about you. You mentioned already, and there are a lot of parallels between, uh, uh, well, Nazi killing and final solution for Jewish people. And it was really like similar situation, you can say, like final solution in Croatia for, for Serbs as mm. well. And then you mentioned what which I also read about. They, they mutilated uh, bodies, so they would uh, they would focus on the differences mm. between them and us, and they are so different. And but one interesting thing, what I've noticed, because it, I, what I know it didn't happen between Nazis and Jews and maybe Hutu and Tutsi, is that they did not convert. But that happened quite often uh, in Croatia, that a lot of Ustasha converted Serbs to Catholicism. Mm. And why they did that, if they considered Serbs so inferior to them, why they would like the inferior people to become Croats? That is one interesting difference, mm. what I've noticed. And I don't know if you came across during your research to some answers. Yeah, so that's really a really interesting question as well. So I didn't come across an answer in this research because this research wasn't really, I mean, this book was originally 12 chapters and they cut out two of the chapters. So it's already too long as a book. So I didn't deal with the Catholic Church. I wanted to, okay. but there just wasn't the room to deal with it and, and the conversions and so on. So what, what was really interesting is for my new work, which is on Aryanization and deportations, I read a lot of the letters of Serb deportees um, or, you know, or Serbs saying, I don't want to be deported to Serbia, or can I keep my property? Or if I give you my house, will you not kill me? All this, you know, really, really um, very sad letters. And what is common to a lot of these letters is they, they ask for conversion to Catholicism. This was long before the conversion program started. And I think I'm more and more convinced that actually the idea came from the victims, that they saw a way 
that we can turn them into Croats, you know, they can become Catholics like us. Um, I mean, that tendency was always there in the movement, but it wasn't as strong, you know, as the kind of people who wanted to kill them all. Um, and so I think a lot of it came from the victims. I suspect they looked at the letters and they saw so many letters from people saying, can I be converted to Catholicism? I feel like I'm a Croat. My fiance is a Catholic. Can I become a Catholic as well? And then I'd be a Croat. That they just decided to do that. And it was like an obvious solution. The reason it didn't work is that, you know, they carried on killing people. You know, so people just decided that, it, you know, ordinary Serbs were not stupid. They, they worked out um, that it wasn't going to save them. So, so why bother doing it? That there's no point. And actually, increasingly Serbs actually refused to do it. And there's, you know, numerous cases where Serbs were deported to Yasanovac because they said, no, I'm not going to do this. I'm not going to convert. This is, this is my identity. And, and I also think, you know, when I was talking before about how they would rip out the beards and the mustaches and kind of eviscerate their identity, this is another way of destroying their identity because they're so closely, you know, Serbian identity is, you know, the Orthodox faith is a very important part of that, or it was perceived as a very important part of that. And so it, it's a very good way of kind of destroying that identity. And then the idea is, is that their children will just be brought up as Croatian Catholics, and, and that would be the whole thing. Um, so yeah, I mean, I think it's kind of ironic that, uh, that a lot of it seems to come from the victims themselves, you know, that they, they see it as a way of saving themselves. And then I think the Ustasha regime just said, well, well we're going to do this. But as I said, they just carried on killing people. Um, so uh, over time, Serbs just, just stopped attending for, for conversions. I mean, the conversions were a joke anyway. I mean, they were, they were not at all, you know, kind of, kind of, canonically consistent or you know I come from a Catholic background it had nothing you know it had nothing to do with that it was about politics not about religion. If I may use this opportunity just to um, bring to your attention this book published in 2019 edited by our Milan Radanovic who is here present as well and published by the Serbian National Council with five excellent chapters in fact uh, based on uh, do documents and archival research um, on this issue of the uh, conversion to Catholicism of the Serbs in independent state of Croatia. So the authors, just to say a little bit more, are Milan Koljanin, um, a well-known professor from Belgrade, uh, history department, and Filip Škiljan, uh, whom you also know as one of the authors in Tragovi and a member of the editorial board. Milan Radanovic as well, whose I think article was uh, the most popular in terms of uh, readership in our first six issues. More than 4,800 downloading of the articles actually we had of one of his articles about the crimes of the Ustasha in Nova Gradiška and Bosanska Gradiška in issue two, I think of our issue. Mm. Igor Merkel, yeah, I mean, previously already mentioned uh, quite uh, rightly, I, I mean, I can, I can undersign everything that Rory said about him. Actually, we are very glad to have him with us as, a, as, a, as an, our author, and uh, Alexandra Kuchekovic. So, I mean, if anyone is interested in this book of you, I mean, please do write to us. I mean, a certain national council is a publisher and we are not a commercial organization. Therefore, our purpose is actually to make available in open access everything that we publish. So we do that and we will do this very gladly. And I would highly recommend this for anyone who wants to know a little bit more about the issue. Thank you. Um, are there any further questions? I saw one hand being raised uh, uh, just to encourage people. Ako mislite da vam je jednostavnije postaviti naravno pitanje na našemu jeziku? Slobodno izvolite, mislim, ja ću pomoći ako je potrebno kod prevoda. Nemojte biti obesrabeni time što je cijeli program na engleskome. Jasna. Jasna, you, you may choose, uh, you know, English or whichever. Yeah, English. thank Jasna you. Jasna Dragovic, <laughs> so, so. <laughs> thank you. Thank you, Dan. Thank you, Rory. That was really, really interesting. And and I had lots of questions coming up, some of which I think overlap with, with Dan's question about, um, you know, the relationship of, of some of the arguments that you have made now about Glina and, and in your work. Um, to sort of to other types of explanations yeah. uh, of these massacres and killings. And of course, I also thought of Max Bergholz's uh, book, which um, I think you, you've reviewed somewhere. Or 
I'm not sure. No, no, I haven't. Oh. Actually, I haven't oh, even okay. it yet. I've, I keep, you know, trying to get around to it. Oh, okay. Because, I mean, quite... there, you know, there's an argument about the political economy of conflict, mm. about um, sort of personal motivations and sort of um, uncontrolled um, uh, bottom-up type of violence, mm. uh, which, you know, then leads to cycles of revenge killings and so on. Yeah. And I'm just wondering about... Um, you know, the relationship of these kinds of motivations to the ones that you have evoked about, you know, sort of a more orchestrated, a more deliberate, a more, um, as you put it, mimetic um, yeah. motivation behind um, behind these types of violence. Yeah, so... And, I, and more specifically you. about the role of, of not just sort of some um, sort of greed or how you have, however you want to call it, but also about the role of revenge. And now I mean not you know orchestrated through short show trials, but actual real revenge killings and cycles of violence. And I'm wondering if you could comment on those. Thank you. Yeah, so it's I, I think you're absolutely right, and Max Burkholz is right to say that private. Um, animosities uh, did play a role in some of this. So the ring, the family that were the main ringleaders of the killings were the Vidakovic family, and they lived next door to um, a Serb family. And, you know, their kids were kind of student dropouts, and they'd been in trouble with the law, and they'd been prosecuted by people in the town. And one of the judges, who's the first people they kill, um, he's actually the judge who prosecutes their son. So I, I absolutely think that there were personal motivations for that. I suppose I've been a little bit, I'm not critical of Max's work, but I, I know that he very much likes his bottom-up argument and Alex Korb does this idea of mass violence rather than genocide because it's not everything driven by the state. The reason I guess I have a slightly different view is that, you know, um, if you look at a lot of Ustasha newspapers from 1941, every single time there's a massacre of Serbs or Serbs are taken off to a camp or something, they bring up some case like, um, oh, this person did this thing at a fair and, and they, he insulted this person's wife or he sent around some people to beat up his, do you know what I mean? So they use that very much as revenge motif to kind of justify what they're doing essentially but on a much larger scale. I suppose that my question is, is this was not happening in 1940. This was not happening in 1939. Why was it not happening? It was happening because you had a state, you know, a, a state that was not encouraging this stuff and facilitating this stuff and mandating this stuff. And I think the difference is in 1941 is you have a state which is not only just encouraging it, it's actually organizing it at the same time. So I absolutely think that personal motivations do play a role. I absolutely think that a lot of it is bottom up. As I said, you know, I think it's very interesting. You know, one of the things I've done is because look at the patterns of economic exchange and what happens to the victim's property. And so and it's completely obvious that people take advantage of it. And it's completely obvious there are personal animosities. But I'm a little bit wary about putting too much emphasis on that. I think obviously Glean is very different to somewhere else, you know, and what happens in Glean happens because partly because of the specificities of Gleaner in terms of socioeconomics and in terms of, you know, intercommunal relations. But I don't want to put too much emphasis on that because I do think at the end of the day, if you had not had the state you'd had in, in Croatia and in greater Croatia in 1941, that wouldn't have happened. You, you wouldn't have had that. And, and it's only the state that can kind of facilitate that. So I think it's the two things together for me, um, you know, but I, I take your point that, I, you know, I think in personal motivations do play a role and I do talk about that a little bit but it's not you know the chapter I mean the, the actual chapter on the Gleaner massacres is already so ridiculously long that I'm just like god I you know there's lots of stuff that I had to leave out the other thing I would also say is that you know the Gleaner massacre isn't just carried out by men from Gleaner the people who are actually in charge of you know facilitating most of that first massacre are you start with stashes who come from Zagreb. They, they come in buses with Zagreb number plates. And, and so it, it's coordinated between the center and it's coordinated between the regions. And you look at other places where early massacres take place, like Trebinja, where this student brigade, uh, you know, kill lots of Serbs in, in, in that part of Bosnia. Again, they come from the University of Zagreb they, 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 and, and they organize local ustashes. So it's kind of like this combination of central direction and then some local organization as well. So I guess I'm a little bit 
on I suppose a little bit on on uh, sitting on both sides that I to I do agree with you I think local government dynamics are really important and I think local relationships and you know revenge and resentments and so on are really just same as they are you know if you're looking at the Soviet purges or you're looking at Rwanda or you're looking at any of these things you can't just put a huge theoretical framework on it and say well well that's what caused it because obviously that isn't it um but I also think kind of the central um uh sorry your 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 zoom has just been photobombed by somebody um uh <laughs> um yeah um but I also think kind of um the state is also really important as well so I yeah so I agree with you yeah thank you apologies that was my mom <laughs> No, that was fine. <laughs> I, I think that's, that's very funny when that kind of thing happens, but never mind. It's, uh, okay, yeah. uh, Alexandra Parovina. Uh, yes, hello, thank you. Thank you for your um, presentation and talk. Um, I just wanted to ask, uh, because I had some like little discussions with you by mail, and I noticed, uh, because I've been doing some research in Estonia on Russian, uh, or Russophone population. And um, I'm just a little bit concerned that this issue of race and, um, you know, the race laws, which were brought also uh, towards Serbs in, in um, Endeha, um, I think it's sort of a little bit undermined. And I noticed also in this academic community uh, where I am, there are some historians uh, that I worked with that don't actually accept that Serbs actually were under these race laws in, in Andahar. So um, this is something I noticed uh, when I was discussing this in Estonia, that they would, for example, say that even now, if you walk in the streets of Marva, you can see the clear difference like between the Russians and Estonians. And um, and to be honest, I feel like that you know, <laughs> myself because I do know that I have Slavic uh, in me, and I do feel it here in this part of the world. It's not something to ignore. And um, I think that um, this is something I feel that it's uh, perhaps um, undermined in Croatia because, of course, you know, we, we were brought up in Yugoslavia to be equal and all of those things. Mm. But as, as soon as we step out, uh, I think it, it's... Um, uh, is it Catherine Baker that wrote about yeah. this? Um, and I, I, I do, I do feel that it's very um, important somehow not to undermine this. You mean under, undermine the difference, the physical differences, or? Uh, well, the fact that uh, you know they, <laughs> there was a race law. Oh, okay. And they, okay. they were like, uh, you know, in that sense, I mean, they, uh, there is this like. Um, idea that they were meant to be annihilated and and regardless of everything else that was happening i think that was the main main idea yeah so i i completely agree with you i think you know a lot of the formal race laws which the aryanization laws they were obviously they did not include serbs formally because they were directed specifically at jews and roma and serbs were not defined as a non-aryan population but if you look at um the way Serbs were talked about in papers, right up until 1945, they were talked in very disparaging racist ways, frankly, you know, again, it's this whole thing of trying to emphasize that there's this big difference that if you're a Serb, you know, you look different to a Croat. So they always said that, you know, Serbs are very dark and they had big noses. This is sounding familiar. It's, it's basically, it's the Jewish uh, stereotype as well. Um, that they have a lot of Asiatic blood, that they have a lot of Roma blood. Um, and even though the racial laws didn't specifically mention Serbs, I mean, they were incorporated into these laws, either de facto or de jure. So, you know, in most towns in Croatia, Serbs were subject to the same curfews as Jews and Roma about where they could travel, uh, where they could work, where they could shop. Uh, they couldn't go to the cinema. They couldn't go to the beach. They couldn't go to the park. So it didn't really make any difference. And actually when the um, local authorities in municipal authorities in the towns in the independent states of Croatia decided to move you know, the Jews into ghettos, they weren't walled ghettos, but they were, they, were sent, they were made to live in particular parts of the city. 
you know, the Serbs w had to go with them. I mean, and it's very interesting. You know, I've just um, done a piece of work on fallout rates from telephone directories in Zagreb and Sarajevo between 1941 and 1942. So, you know, who, whose numbers changes and who, you know, and it, 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 the Jewish fallout rate is very, very high, but the Serbian fallout rate is almost as high. I mean, it's huge. I mean, people just disappear. They just disappeared from the telephone directories. So I think you're right. I don't think they were subject to the laws on aryanization, but a lot of the laws that were targeted at them were basically race laws. They were just weren't necessarily framed as a race law per se. Um, so, you know, you had all the laws on, you know, uh, use of Cyrillic alphabet that was all banned. Um, you know, so there was a lot of cultural things that were taking place as well. And um, yeah, I, I think, you know, um, I mean, I think the reason why they didn't have ra specific race laws for Serbs in terms of official race laws, this is a, a law is because it would have been very, very difficult for them because there were too many Serbs in the independent state of Croatia to have done that. Um, and they, they didn't have the same, I mean, you know, how do you tell the difference between a Serbian name and a, Croatian name. It's not easy. You know, it's easy with a Jewish name and it's easy with a Roma name. It's more difficult with a Roma name, but you can do it. But, you know, with a lot of Serbian or Croatian names, they're, you know, someone whose first name is Dejan and their surname is Lasic or something. Is that a Serb? Is, I don't know. Like with a lot of these people, you you couldn't tell what their names were. So I think a I think typical example difficult. for this is Vladimir Velebit or Vladko Velebit. I mean, that is yeah. uh, you know very few people who are actually not very very much into this detail might actually get completely uh, confused. And there are many other cases. Uh, yeah, or you like know this. Daniel Serb, who's a big crazy. <laughs> yes, like, you know that's really. And we have this the Serb out. representative Horvat as well. You know. There's yeah, exactly. All sorts There's of a whole things, guy all sorts of things Horvat, have. who's a Serbian nationalist. Yes. So it just gets very confusing. I um, mean, right. unless you have a name like Savo, you know, something which is very obviously very Serb and very orthodox, then so Nemanja Stefanovic or things like that. Anyway, okay, I. Th I think unless there are further questions, we came uh, very close to, to the end to our allocated 90 minutes of, of this event. Um, so I would like to do a couple of things at the end. I mean, first of all, um, I would like to invite everybody present here. Uh, if you got inspired or provoked by anything we have heard uh, in this marvelous Rory's uh, lecture, uh, do not hesitate to write it down and, and, and to make some contribution. Um, and send it to us, to tragovi.redakcia at uh, gmail.com or to me, dejan.jovic at whatever ad address you use, fpzg or whoever, you know. Uh, but certainly to, um, or announce or just like say that you would like to make a contribution, we would like to consider this and then ideally to publish it in one of our next uh, issues. We remain uh, continuously interested in this topic um, and in many other topics within this big tent of uh, Serbian and Croatian um, studies. That's number one. Uh, number two is we originally actually didn't didn't make to, to um, broadcast or publish this debate. And although we recorded it, in fact, this was meant to be for the archive of, of Serbs. But uh, it was really so good that I, I'm now trying to reconsider maybe this. But in any case, I would like to invite you just to say what you think of this. I mean, if there is anyone who, if we decide that actually it would, might be useful to have it somewhere um, on YouTube or you know, in, on our web pages or something, um, I, if you object to that, we will not obviously do that. But I mean, certainly send us an email if you feel, for example, in particular, that that's not maybe a good idea. Uh, well, the reason why we don't advertise it very widely is because we want to have a normal debate. I mean, and you know, we, we in order to have a normal free debate, you know, uh, sometimes too much publicity of this, and and people who are unqualified but have they know exactly what happened without ever reading or investigating anything. Uh, might not make a contribution, but I think in this particular case, uh, I think we have done a very, very good jo job. And then the, the 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 final thing is, I would like to to thank uh, wholeheartedly and warmly on behalf, I'm sure, of everybody present here to Rory Yeomans uh, for his wonderful lecture, and and to everyone who participated uh, through questions or 
or just listening, that's a contribution just as well. I mean, it, 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 it's always useful to talk, but it's always useful also to listen to others as well. I mean, these, these are two sides of, of, of academic work. Uh, and, uh, and to wish him uh, well, I mean, actually to wish him all the best uh, with his further research. And we very much look forward to reading his new book. And also to stay in touch, I mean, uh, both uh, either uh, through authorship or for organizing of next events and uh, with all of you as well. So thank you so much, Rory. I think that's uh, that's all for today. Thank okay. you so much. We no, will be in touch. Much. Yeah. And thank you very much for the great questions as well. They were really good. Sure. Okay, thank you. cheers. We will be in touch with uh, announcement of further events. Bye bye. Okay, brilliant. Cheers. Bye. Bye.